right, so welcome to the Q2, Q3 of 2020 uh, briefing for Open Aquila as part of the Unicon Open Source Support Program. I will be presenting today to you. Uh, my name is Chris Beach. I am the Unicon Open Aquila Tech Lead, and more generally, I'm a software developer at Unicon, uh, currently focused on open source software and content strategy. So for our agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about hope, how Open Aquila has, um, has fared during the time of you know, the concerns with COVID um, and how it's kind of uh, withstood increased load and those kind of things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how, um, how Open Aquila was represented at Open Aperio uh, this last year in June. Uh, we'll give an update on what Unicon has been doing in terms of giving back um, to the application based on um, based on our sustaining engineering budget um, and then we'll talk about more globally as a community where open aquila is headed talk about some upcoming events and we'll just open it up for q a so like every pretty much every uh, you know application out there that has to deal with learning um, there's there's an increased load now due to users going more online um, blended classes uh, and you know how does how do the applications that folks are used to using um, how do they work with this increased load? Uh, what we saw so far, just kind of as a summary, is that Open Aquila did fairly well. Um, we had two adopters that were um, that we were able to pull some statistics from, and they were able to talk a little bit of a story about their experience with Open Aquila. Uh, so the first one was Zovio. And I'll just go ahead and read what they sent us. Uh, they said that since we were already 100% online, we didn't see a huge uptick in the stats, but below are a few of the bullets around how we did leverage Aquila during COVID. Now, they leveraged Aquila to manage some COVID-related documents and communications. And this allowed us to make quick and easy updates as information was continuously being updated. And then they leveraged Aquila to help support several business units manage the transition of their teams working um, in the office to working 100% remote. Um, in terms of the statistics, right, how we're able to say that Open Aquila or Aquila continue to um, serve their learners well, um, their usage was uh, increased um, on an average of about 339,000 hits. Um, when you look at uh, the month in 2019 to the month in 2020, uh, and they're running about a monthly average of about 6.3 million hits for March, April, May, and August. And then September, they showed a bigger jump uh, that I felt was noteworthy, about 1.78 million hits um, increase from last year. Um, and they're running around 7.62 million hits. And their monthly average of users then increased as well by no less than 61,000. Um, and through all of that, their average time spent actually decreased, like per hit, um, increased by a few milliseconds. And so their average time for um, requesting content and files from Open Aquila or Aquila is around 25 milliseconds. Uh, keep in mind, this is an average over lots of different content, right? So little JavaScript files and big images and stuff, um, that's all kind of munched together in that average. Uh, but it does give the idea um, of how, uh, kind of a litmus test of how Open Aquila is, um, is faring. The other adopter um, that uh, we were able to get some statistics on was BYU Idaho. Um, and I'll go ahead and again just read what they wrote and then we'll talk about some of their statistics. Uh, the move to, so they said that the move to Unicon hosting Open Aquila on AWS um, added increased stability and better responsiveness, which increased adoption. Uh, we have three different programs at BYU-Idaho, traditional degrees, fully online degrees, and pathway certificates. Pathway certificates are offered at very low cost in countries all over the world, including underserved populations in Africa, Asia, the Pacific Rim, and Haiti. Open Aquila increasingly serves content for classes in the pathway program. Open Aquila is increasingly being used to offer HTML content as it facilitates the ability for less technical people to author content in a more secure environment. All right, so they didn't offer a lot of, you know, 
This is specifically how Open Aquila has helped us during COVID. Um, but they, you know, talking about their global reach and um, and kind of their some of their content needs and how Open Aquila is is that solution for them. For their statistics, now it's a little bit different than Zovio, uh, but still tells the same kind of story, where their um, their monthly year-over-year -year stats um, for number of hits increased by an average of 1.2 million, um, and now they're running about 2.72 million hits per month. Uh, their average monthly users also increased by about 29,000, um, and they're they're seeing about 114,000 um, unique user sessions a month. Um, their average time spent, um, some sometimes the performance got just a little bit worse, but it was no more than one tenth of a second. Um, and other months saw uh, an improved performance uh, that overall averaged out to about 123 milliseconds per hit. Uh, the interesting thing about BYU Idaho, um, like it was, um, like they noted in that second bullet point, is that they are global, right? And so all of these these statistics are showing where users are pulling content from all different parts of the globe. Uh, then we were able to gather some um, some statistics that is more of the global community, right? Um, and so this is a little bit more general, um, but still. Uh, it helps to solidify that story that as Open Aquila is being used more, um, it's able to handle that increased load. Right? Um, all of these adopters, uh, as I was talking with the folks that host them, um, said that uh, there's been really no concerns with Aquila um, responsiveness as these increases happened. And we see things like 35% increase in total access, 24% increase in total hits, um, you know, number of visitors increased 155%, uh, and then the, the large adopter that saw the number of hits uh, essentially double to 10 million, um, pretty significant. And then that that last bullet point where an adopter saw their visitors increase about sixfold. All right, so some pretty significant changes. Um, and when you when you compare institutions to institutions, some might be smaller, some might be bigger, but overall we saw this um, this shift towards using um, Aquila or Open Aquila more, um, and Open Aquila was able to um, stay stable and continue to be a responsive application, um, which was uh, not necessarily surprising, but it was it was good to see. So let's switch then to how um, how Open Aquila was represented at Open Aperio. Um, it's nice to see some folks online that uh, participated in Open Aperio uh, for Open Aquila. Um, so three uh, three main kind of discussion um, presentations. Uh, Open Aperio switched their format this year. They recognized that there was um, siloing occurring where all the Sakai folks would go to only the Sakai presentations and then the U portal folks would only go to U portal presentations. Um, not that they were disinterested in other applications, but you know, they wanted to talk about the application they used the most. Um, and, um, and so what Aperio did this year just happened to coincide with um, having to be virtual due to COVID concerns is that they had the first two um, days in the morning uh, be committed to um, single track presentations. And so they went through pretty much every Aperio application um, and each community got about 20 minutes to present on uh, kind of the state of their project. Um, and so I presented on the state of Open Aquila, uh, provided an overview of the application, how the community is doing, the feature sets, where we're headed, uh, and we were able to get that exposed to the um, you know, to the wider Aperio um, user base. Uh, there was a showcase that I did on um, some custom scripting that supported Creative Commons uh, as as a way to show how you can be flexible with Open Aquila. Um, this one adopter needed to migrate their Creative Commons licensing from 3.0 to 4.0, and 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 they needed to do it in such a way that their users could. Um, 
to control which version of the license their content was associated with, but encourage the users to go to the more recent version. Um, and, and so this scripting um, shows how you can do that. Um, the adopter was willing to have the scripting open source, which was appreciated. Um, and so the link is there and it'll be in the, in the slides and in the briefing, um, in the blog um, for this briefing. And then the last one um, that I found, um, you know, one of the most beneficial because we had, you know, adopters of Open Aquila talking about why they use Open Aquila. And I think that's, that hits home the most to other people, right? And that's what we are actually just strove to do as we were um, at Open Aperio this year across the application, the open source applications that we work with is work on, um, uh, encouraging these case studies, these user stories. Why do I use the application, right? Instead of the the deep technical sessions, right? The the Creative Commons one was a little more technical, um, and we wanted to focus on case studies. Um, so what uh, the we were able to have Matt Miles from BYU Idaho, and then Mary Glenn and Kim Palencia from Quinnipiac um, offer insights on how their institutions leverage Open Aquila. Um, and it was really interesting to see uh, BYUI's usage and then Quinnipiac's usage, and they're different. Um, it just kind of shows how Open Aquila can be a very customized solution, um, but you're all, you know, we're still using and supporting that same um, core application. And so I appreciated uh, those adopters' willingnesses to uh, kind of share their experience. So we we'll move into a, an update with sustaining engineering. Uh, just as a reminder to folks, sustaining engineering is part of the Unicon open source support program um, for any of the applications, right? Um, and it's it's meant to help um, the idea that when you use open source software, um, you, there really should be some give back to the application um, in terms of security maintenance, um, some you know upgrades that are needed, um, just some features that might be needed as well, and Unicon is willing to do that kind of on behalf of the subscribers that we have, um, and we call that sustaining engineering. And so we get us uh, an amount of hours um, kind of per subscriber that we're able to do that with, and then we look at our subscriber base and say, you know, what do they need right now, right? I mean, the application as a whole could could use something, but what do our subscribers need? And that's what we'll focus on. So our um, our efforts really focused on um, on the Blackboard integration. Um, this came out of an issue where um, Blackboard is changing their hosting um, kind of paradigm. They're going to a um, a SaaS model, and they're you know they're switching off web services, and that was breaking functionality. Um, and so we reckon, Unicon recognized that and put um, as much sustaining engineering hours as we could to, to create uh, an MVP um, uh, solution to still be able to integrate Open Aquila with Blackboard. Um, the building block solution is, has become brittle, right? The web services no longer work, um, but there is a way around it. And, um, and now in the latest Open Aquila, it's available. Um, the, uh, there's kind of two main components. Uh, the LTI integration, where you're in Blackboard and you um, go into an Open Aquila selection session and you pull content into the LMS. Uh, that was working previous to these quarters uh, that we're um, kind of that we're reporting on, if you will, um, but that's available. And then in the um, in Q2 and Q3 of this year, we really f com, um, focus on completing um, the REST application side of it, or the REST integration. Um, there's, there's still more work that can be done, um, but it allows users in Open Aquila to be able to um, add, um, add content into Blackboard courses while staying in Open Aquila. Um, there's some interesting things that came out um, as Blackboard um, has created certain terms and conditions around their REST application, uh, or I'm sorry, around their REST APIs. 
Uh, and so if you are interested in, in moving to the new Blackboard integration, be aware that there are rate limits for kind of that free tier of REST application IDs. And then there's some REST application ID uh, terms and conditions that need to be resolved. Um, and Unicon is proactively starting to work with Blackboard to understand how they, um, how they are willing to work with open source software because their terms and conditions read like the, the application is a commercial offering, right? Um, and that's just not the case with open Aquila. There's lots of different adopters that, um, you know, that not one adopter is going to want to pay for, you know, another adopter's usage of this, um, of this integration. And so it needs to be somewhat separate and we're working with Blackboard to understand um, how we can just continue to create that same seamless experience now with more standard um, Blackboard flows um, in the, going forward in the future. Uh, we worked a little bit on build process improvement that just kind of speaks to sustaining engineering, also helping just the overall health of the application. Um, and then we set up a building block um, in a previous quarter, um, but continued that effort to enhance this migration building block that migrates your old Open Aquila um, uh, building block LTI links to kind of first class Blackboard LTI links. Um, and so you can get away from that, that brittle uh, building block and, um, and not be so concerned about you know, Blackboard upgrades that are you know, gonna break all your course links. Moving into the roadmap, so sustaining engineering was what Unicon um, had, was specifically focused on um, for, you know, for that budget that we, we talked about. Uh, this Open Aquila roadmap is really about our understanding of where the application is headed. Um, it's a little bit about what we're doing, and it's also what the community is doing. And so in the next, uh, like, six months, right, uh, you should be seeing uh, more security upgrades coming into Open Aquila in terms of dependencies, right? So, like, Tika is being upgraded um, you know, Tomcat is being upgraded, right? All these dependencies that make Open Aquello run, um, they sometimes there's security notices that come out, and the community is watching that and um, and upgrading as as we're able to. Uh, there's also going to be a couple of major frameworks that are going to be upgraded, which will allow for uh, better stability. Uh, we're going to be able to move faster if there is a security update that's needed. Um, and these frameworks are you know, Spring 5 and then Hibernate 5. Touches, you know, the data layer of, uh, pretty much the entire data layer of Open Aquila. So it'll be really good to have that be at a more modern level. Um, it, kind of a case in point, uh, if you try to upgrade Tika right now in Open Aquila, you will be blocked because we're on a lower version of Spring of CFX. Uh, if you then try to upgrade CFX, you will note that you're blocked because you're on a lower version of Spring. And then trying to upgrade Spring, you know, that's a that's a huge core framework. Um, and so there's um, there's a process that needs to be followed where you're upgrading your major frameworks, and you want to keep them as current as you can. So when you need to upgrade something that's maybe relatively um, small, like Tika, um, it's not going to require, a, you know a bunch of downstream changes in order to just, you know, apply a security patch. The other things that are coming through um, in Open Aquila is, you know, a little more flashy as well. Um, so the, the UI is continuing to be enhanced to be modern, right? Uh, sections, if, if you're familiar with the, the technical side of Open Aquila, the, the theory of sections and how uh, the UI is displayed. Um, it's not very responsive, um, and, um, and you can create your own themes in Open Aquila, but it, it was, again, it was a little bit brittle, right? And when you looked at Open Aquila, you, you kind of got the feeling that the application was a bit dated, right? It's, it's a powerful application, um, but the UI needed kind of a refresh. And so the group that's, that's doing this recognized that pretty much a fundamental shift in how Open Aquila works with its UI needed to be changed. 
And so they're taking all of the REST application, I'm sorry, they're taking um, all the um, interaction from the UI uh, to the back end and they're separating that in a REST interface. Uh, so if you wanted to create your own application that talks to the back end of Open Aquila, you could do that, right? Um, and it'll be, it could run completely headless or you can use this new UI. Uh, the new UI um, looks pretty slick. Um, they are using Google Material Design. Um, they're setting up a theming um, editor that is um, kind of all-inclusive, right? And so you want to change your secondary colors, you can go ahead into one place in the application, do that, and it just updates everywhere. Um, pretty slick. What they're focused on um, in this next release is, um, is migrating the search UI and the selection session UI into this new UI framework. Uh, the selection session UI is again for um, uh, when you're um, in an LMS and you're trying to reach into open a call and pull out content, um, that's, you're using a selection session and so that'll be updated um, and it'll be pretty nice to see. Um, so that, you know, that this new UI is responsive um, and so when you use it inside of a responsive LMS, then, you know, they, they all just kind of work together a lot better. Uh, one of the features that is also being added um, is called search facets. Uh, this feature was, came out as a beta in like Open Aquila 6.5 or 6.6 and then was removed uh, just, you know, just due to the, um, the available efforts at the time to, uh, to work on the feature but it's coming back uh, to stay for good is my understanding. And the idea behind search, search, it's like a dynamic advanced search, right? So in advanced searches or power searches, you can specify um, metadata paths and then you can give like predefined values for users to search against. Uh, but that's kind of a canned search and you, you guide the user very specifically on the, um, on the search pattern that you want them to use. Search facets are a little bit different where you are able to take, you're able to just choose from a list of metadata paths um, kind of at will and create your own search, you know, based on, on your needs. So I'm pretty excited to, um, to have that come forth and, and just to have that more flexibility in the search fields. All right, so in terms of upcoming events, uh, these are events that Unicon will be present at or Open Aquila will be discussed at. Uh, so uh, the Canvas um, conference, uh, Canvas Con, it's going on right now, so October 15th, and they're having, I think it's like six sessions uh, spaced throughout the day. So everyone around the globe or most people around the globe uh, will be able to kind of more in their working hours be able to go in and talk about Canvas stuff. Um, and so Unicon will be there if you're interested in Canvas and Open Aquila. Um, you can go ahead and, and talk to us there about that or anything else that you'd like to pick our brains on. Uh, Educause, yeah, sorry, Educause um, will be hosted um, in about two weeks. Again, all of these events are virtual due to the, the COVID concerns. Um, and Unicon will have a presence there. So if you want to talk to us about anything, um, education technology related, uh, we will be there and, and happy to, to sit down and talk with him. Uh, the, the next event, Edel Expo, um, might be a new term to folks that are to U.S. adopters. And so the, um, the regional support provider for Open Aquila in Australia and Asia Pacific um, is called Edelax. Um, and they're, they're a bunch of sharp guys that have a lot of deep open and color experience. Um, they're actually the ones working on all the, um, the new UI changes. Um, and their subscriber base, um, they host a user conference called Edel Expo. Uh, due to the COVID concerns and just state of kind of the world right now, uh, they've chosen to open it up to pretty much anyone that wants to join, right? So if you have an interest in open and color, you don't have to be a subscriber to um, at Alax, you can just go ahead and join. Um, it's November 4th in the U.S., uh, November 5th in Australia due to the, the date change difference. Um, and so if you have a chance, I'd, I'd highly suggest you go and, um, and take a look at what they have to say. And they'll be, I'm sure they'll be demoing um, the new UI efforts that they've been doing as well there, if you want to take a look at that. 
Um, and then the, the final event, uh, it'll be the, the next briefing like we're having now, um, right after Q1 of next year. So sometime in early April, uh, we'll host another briefing, uh, just kind of seeing kind of the state of where we're at with Open Aquila and kind of get a pulse on things. And so that ends the, the agenda of the briefing. Um, and before we open it up to kind of general questions, I wanted to, to get folks thinking about two questions, right? And to take a step back from the content solution of Open Aquila um, and, and ask yourself, how, how are you doing with your content strategy, right? Um, solutions are great and they're needed because otherwise you don't actually have something to offer, um, but you need to have a backing strategy that um, is going to be able to handle things like, um, you know, increased uh, user load, but you're changing, you know, dynamic classes and, and, you know, lots of different things that can happen in the world, happen to your institution. Um, how flexible is your content strategy, right? And if you feel that your content strategy is fairly mature, you don't really have any pain points and you're happy with it, your users are all kind of focused on one repository, uh, congratulations, that's a pretty cool place to be. If you are, um, if you're in the back of your mind, you're like, well, there's, there's a couple things that we'd really like to, to fix or you know, I just don't know how to solve this or whatnot, uh, please feel free to reach out to, um, to Unicon. Uh, we like talking to people about their, um, about educational technology. Um, uh, you know, content strategy is one of the areas, but it kind of gets to the second point um, on this slide. Uh, really anything in the user journey, um, you know, from any touch points that your institution has with the user, from prospective students walking onto campus for a tour or looking at your website all the way to now they've become an alumni. Uh, right, and they're, um, they've gone through your entire process and, and you've been able to support them in their learning experience, um, do you have any pain points that you're, you know, maybe you're working to solve them now or you're trying to figure out how you can solve them, uh, Unicon, that's, that's Unicon's bread and butter. That's what we do is we help institutions um, take a look at their learner journey identify some er the areas that they could um, streamline, improve, and then we can help you create a plan to get where you want to be on your learner journey. So, um, you know, kind of some introspective questions there. Um, and if you feel um, the desire to, please reach out to us and we'd love to have a conversation. All right. Well, with that, I appreciate folks coming today. Uh, folks, just stay safe out there and we'll talk to you online. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys for coming.